The league's top guns continue their toward pace. Alberta's two heavyweights of the past five years get reacquainted and decisions that will impact several teams' futures loom. It's go time on the Junior B's pod. That's Klucha, and he goes short side low. The Rebels are right back in it. Oh, Lord, he's stuffed by Luke West. What the hell is going on? And Kerr. What? Seven seconds is all it took for Kerr. Quick shot scores. Jacob Boudreau. Well, Keenan, plenty of action this past week. Let's uh, go through a bit of a rundown on what took place over the past calendar week. Well, a trifecta of games to kick off the weekend on Friday the 14th as the Rampage make the trip up north into St. Albert, knocking off the crew to 11-10. to 10. The SWAT come into town from out east into the Mounties. 14-12 victory the SWAT walk away with. And the Silver Tips and the Chill battle it out at Brentwood with the Silver Tips coming up 6-5, victorious in that one. Moving on to the 15th on Saturday, five games on the docket as the Chill take out the Outlaws, 12-8. The SWAT make the trip up north, Rebels taking them down by a hefty margin of 20-3. The Shamrocks and the Warriors, again, like you said in the intro, they get reacquainted. The Shamrocks come out victorious, uh, knocking off the Warriors' Long win streak inside the Bill Hunter Arena. 10-6 final score for the Shamrocks. And the Blizz playing a pair of games against the Rampage and the Mavericks. They beat the Rampage 8-5, but just can't do it against the Mavericks. 11-7 the final there in favor of Mountain View. And Sunday on the 9th, six games total. Warriors take out the SWAT 11-4. Shamrocks and Crude 14-5. Shamrocks win after a bit of a wonky game we'll get into a bit later. Rebels take down the Silver Tips 6 5. Mavericks 13 over the Outlaws 4. Blizz knocking off the Mounties 5 4. And the Marauders take down the Rockies 15 3. So it was a bit of a case of the league's better teams sort of starting to pull away. You saw a lot of guys go off and a lot of teams that you would expect to see come out on top doing so over the course of the past week. Now let's start off by talking a little bit about the South as the Shamrocks come North and they send a message to the rest of the league as they get their first win over the Warriors since pre COVID. They were able to take them down by a score of 11 to six, 10 to six, excuse me. And I thought this was a pretty well played game, Keenan. I thought that uh, you know, there there was a a pretty good amount of pace to this game. I thought that there was a limited amount of turnovers, a lot of you know, um there wasn't too many unforced errors. It was a clean game. I thought both teams um, you know, had their moments. The Warriors, I thought, started off pretty well, and then as the game went on, they looked like they got a little bit fatigued. Uh, and I'll get to this a little bit later. I just think there's a little bit too much riding on some of their top guys. And the Shamrocks, I thought, did a better job of staying out of the box, and their power play clicked a little bit better than maybe what the Warriors did, although I don't have the numbers in front of me. But at the end of the day, I, I thought that the Shamrocks were well-deserving of, of the win. Um, the Warriors, true to form, I thought they played hard, um, just fell a little bit short. And then the Shamrocks able to go into St. Albert the next day and the crew able to get up three nothing in that one before the the Shamrock sort of took over. I think it was like six or seven five after the second period. I don't know you did that game, Keenan, but um, yeah, that uh, game eventually... was a little bit weird inside the Jerome Gimla. I mean, I don't think anybody kind of expected the crew to hold to go toe to toe with the Shamrocks, but uh, yeah, through the first forty minutes, I mean, it went into the second uh, intermission. I believe it was 6-5 in favor of the Shamrocks, and then the Shamrocks just absolutely lit it up in the third. Um, but yeah, that was a interesting game to be on the call for, no doubt. Yeah, eventually the Shamrocks able to pull away there, and I think the crew deserves some credit uh, for their past weekend here. It would have been easy to sort of throw in the towel. They also lose Bennett Fry to a, uh, I believe he blew out his patella or something like yes, that. Yes, he had um, knee surgery Um Actually, today, as of recording, he had knee surgery. Another unfortunate event for them, but you know what? They deserve they deserve credit. Um, they're playing short man, right, short handed right now, and I think that 
I don't know any time that you can take Red Deer to overtime and then um, you know you know play a pretty quality forty minutes against the Shamrocks, whether it was their A game or not. Uh, I think the crew deserves some acknowledgement there. Uh, they are making some changes, and we'll see how those changes develop. And it, and I would expect more as we go into the deadline. Now, also in the South, the Mounties on Friday night took what would be classified as probably a bad loss as they lose at home to Saskatchewan. Rory Dane, who's been excellent all season, been impressed every time I've watched him play, goes off five goals, four assists, nine, or yeah, not five goals, four assists, nine points. Unfortunately for the Mountaineers, it wasn't enough and what was a tough little goal for them. Um, so they drop a little bit further in the South standings. Meanwhile, the Marauders able to beat up once again on the Rockies. Nothing really to talk about there. I think everybody at this point would expect that. So the standings in the South pretty much stay status quo. Um, and since we just were talking about the crude, let's stay in the North and the Warriors able on Sunday to bounce back from their loss to the Shamrocks as they take down the SWAT 11-4. And it was a very, I did this game, Keenan, it was a very quiet Bill Hunter arena. Nobody was there. It was a 12-30 start. Uh, terrible <laughs> what a weird start, start time. Though. Yeah, and, and it was, it was, both teams looked like they were half asleep. Um, but the Warriors needed the two points. They got it. And that's really all there is to say about that game. Uh, other than the fact that, you know, their their guns continued to, to contribute. And shout out to Dylan Nicholson, who gets his first goal. Actually got two in the game at the Junior B level. The Tier 2 call-up gets on the board for them. And they have a big one coming up this Friday night at the Rebels, as those two teams are going to battle it out. For the North Division title, speaking of the Rebels, they smack the SWAT on Saturday and then get a big statement win at home against the Silver Tips. And the Silver Tips made it close late in the game. Looking at the box score, I know I saw they scored a couple of goals in the final two and a half minutes. Pretty close together, but unable to get that third one to even it up. Guys like Jackson Baker and Nolan Eastwood with big weekends. Um, I know that... Puck, I think it's Pook, actually. Sorry if I mispronounced that. I believe it's Pook. I was told that's what it is, but I believe Pook and Owen also had big nights against the SWAT. So they're getting some big-time efforts offensively from some of their front gate guys, and they've really put themselves in a position right now to to sort of be in the driver's seat in the north, and it's going to take... Most likely a warrior sweep of the Rebels to overtake them with, you know, about six, seven games to go in the season. And also, we got to mention the Outlaws, of course, who are also in the North. And they go down to the Chill. They played a pair of home games. They go down to the Chill, 12-8, and then also go down to the Mavericks, 13-4. to And the Outlaws right now look a bit disjointed. Um they're 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 in some flux. They've got some roster turnover right now. Uh, a lot of a lot of track. I mean, I did their game against the Chill, and both ways. I mean, there were opportunities back and forth. Guys were wide open in transition. I thought both teams were were not doing a very good job of either getting back or getting off the floor and, and sort of taking away those types of fast break opportunities. The Outlaws did fall to the chill on Saturday, and the Wallace brothers had big games in that one. Dumoulin and Bannister also being pretty prolific. Um, And then on Sunday, they were the victims of Luke Hildebrandt, man. Like eight goals (laughs) and one assist. Eight goals? I I know I talked about this last week, but I don't know if I've ever seen a guy who scores in bunches like this. (laughs) Last year, seven against the Crude. Last week, five against the Silver. Silver tips eight this week against the Mavericks. He also had five or six against, I think it was six against uh, the blizzard on Saturday. Like what in the world? Like where is this guy an alien? Like seriously, like I've never actually seen this guy play, but I mean, it almost, when you look at his box scores, it truly feels like he's, he's straight out of a movie. Uh, and but, like you look at his box scores too, and majority of his goals are even strength. Like that's the, that's the real kicker on that one. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I'm looking forward to seeing him play live, but um, from what I'm told, he's a 
he's a sniper. Like the guy can just rip the ball. So Will, I'm I'm excited to see him play live. I know I'm I think I'm doing their game against the Warriors coming up, but the the Outlaws do fall a couple of times at home, but they still sit comfortably in that last playoff spot in the north. Um, and probably worth they, mentioning as well with the Outlaws. Uh Outlaws and the crude making a trade earlier this week. Uh crude receiving Preston Stewart in exchange for Regan Walker and Chase Richardson. Uh that trade was a little earlier this week. Uh decent trade, in my opinion. Helps out both clubs. Yeah, so they continue to to turn to turn their roster over a little bit and a lot of changes. I would expect I would expect more changes out of there as we move closer to the deadline. But they yes, yeah, so they they drop those two games, but they're still comfortably in that last playoff spot, and they still have a game against the Rockies. Essentially, the crew would have to win four of their last five to surpass them, and um, yeah, I don't I don't think anybody would say that that's likely. It's not impossible, but it's not likely, especially with you know the uh just where their roster is sitting right now so that's the north um and we'll talk a little bit more about what could change there but i want to move over to the central and we just talked about the mavericks and they come away with another couple of wins they're red hot right now they have opened up a little bit of a lead over red deer in that division i know that red deer did come away with the overtime win against the crew Tisday and, and Dowswell with big games, six points and five points respectively. Uh, but then they did, I mean, this is, and I, I wanted to talk about this. They play at eight or eight 30 against the crew in St. Albert and then 11 AM back at home against the blizzard. Well, I, I just, I don't like, uh, seriously, I don't, there's no, really no words that I can provide right now. But when I saw that, I was like, what? Like, I know the Blizzard had to play two games that day, but why not have them play it, you know, whatever, one thirty or 2 o'clock against the Mavericks and then have them play Red Deer at night, like 8 o'clock? I, I don't... Anyways, I, when I saw that, I just kind of shook my head. But Red Deer does fall to the Blizzard 8-5, so they split. They're kind of playing a little bit a little bit down from where they were a couple of weeks ago, just from what I've seen. Um, and just judging from some of the box scores, uh, but you know, they still got plenty of time and they're still got a little bit of a lead over the chill who I mentioned beat the outlaws, but also suffered, a, suffered a loss the night before a tight one, six, five to the silver tips. And man, the chill have to lead the league in one goal and two goal losses. I don't even think it's close. Not um, even. yeah, they're victims of, of some very, very unfortunate results. I would say, I mean, just the odds of losing that many one goal, two goal games are pretty low. Uh, again, though, um, they they take the silver tips to the brink, fall short, they split, so they have some work to to do. The silver tips, barring a collapse, are going to finish up atop that division. Uh, I just don't think there's enough racetrack. Although they are playing a little bit, I would say a little bit down from where they were uh, at the start of the season. I'd almost um, the, call it a bit sloppy compared to the start of the season for the Silver Tips. I don't know what's been going on recently, but to me, it seems like it's been a little bit of sloppy play from them. Maybe a little bit of complacency. Um, you know, they got out to that big lead in the division, uh, and that happens sometimes. This this part, like this section of the schedule, as you sort of move through late June or like mid to late June, right before the final three or four games of the season, as teams really kind of tune up for the playoffs and have made their deadline moves right before that. There's sometimes there are a lull. There's a lull with some teams that are sort of positioned comfortably. So maybe, I mean, I'm not there. I don't see very many central games, but uh, that maybe some of that's going on. I don't know, but I think I, I still expect them to finish first in that division. So really what it's going to come down to right now is the chill are going to have to go five and I would say five and two in the remaining seven games. And I think they have seven games left. It could be six, but I think it's seven. But either way, they're going to have to, they're probably going to have to go five and two. And they're probably going to have to either sweep Red Deer with their two game set or sweep the Mavericks. I believe they play them both twice more. So if they can kind of get four points against one of those two teams, that would go a long way in chasing one of them down for a playoff spot. Uh, but they are in tough. And from what I saw against the Outlaws, their their offense is, is good. There's no question about it. And they got some game breakers. 
Uh, but they're they're going to need a little bit. They're going to need a little bit better goaltending, I think, in some of these games, and they're going to need to clean up some of their reverse transition. The Outlaws had like just, especially in the second period, like break after break. Guys were standing like out of the bench. They would step out of the bench and stand right in front of the net. So if they can clean some of that up, uh, I think that will help them in some of these close games. But the, yeah, they do have some work in the central. That's sort of how that stands. And lastly, the East, the Kings were off. So not much to speak about with them. They, they're they going to sort of stay. I mean, we'll get to the power rankings later. I'm not likely not going to move them down just because they didn't play. But we can talk about them at a later date. The Blizzard start with a couple of games in central Alberta before they move down to Calgary and they go two and one. So they beat Red Deer and then they lose to the Mavericks and then they're able to beat the Mountaineers in a close one, five, four and the blizzard probably play. I just talked about the chill losing as many close games as anybody I've, I've seen in a long time. The blizzard probably play more close games than I've seen in anybody in a long time. Like, they're they're never getting blown out and they're never really blown out anybody. Like they're always involved in tight games. And I think uh that's not an easy little run there to go Red Deer, Mavericks, Mounties. Like you're playing in three different centers in about 24 hours. Um, and that's pretty impressive to go two on one, really. And if there's any team that's gonna be outside the top five after this week that has a you know a little bit of a complaint of not being in there, a little bit of a spoiler here, it's the blizzard, because they play a odd schedule and they do very well with it. So they're still a team that I think is dangerous and they're definitely going to give the Kings a, a hard time in the playoffs. So that's sort of where I'm at with a lot of these divi- or with these divisions. Uh, any, any extra sort of tidbits you want to throw in here? I, uh, you know, I don't think I have much else to add. I think I've said most of my pieces. Um, There was definitely, I think some weird things happening this past weekend. Um, again, like I touched on, like the crude, um, sticking with the Shamrocks, and then you know the Shamrocks taking off the Warriors for the first time since pre-COVID, um, and then yeah, like just these tight games and all that, and this <laughs> the back half of this season has definitely been an interesting one, and uh, you know definitely one to watch for sure. Yeah, no, and I think there's a lot of guys, uh, you know, just teams, players, um, staffs um, that do deserve a lot of credit right now. Um, There's some very good lacrosse being played. uh, And I think you're seeing, you know, some of the better teams start to separate, which is what you want to see. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty natural in the ebb and flow of a season when you get around this point and the deadline starting to approach uh, you see the, the better teams start to pull away. And I think you're seeing, starting to see a lot of that. And with that, I want to, take this time to point out how impressed I am really with some of the, I would say mental makeup of a lot of these kids that are coming into junior lacrosse. Um, You know, I find myself thinking all the time, like, man, the way they approach the game, the way that they, they sort of just sort sort of seem to play free, you know, not overly like dressed or or worried. They're, they're playing with uh, so much confidence. And they, they seem to be unfazed and and bracing everything around them. And, uh, you know, there's there's so many young players that you can point to where, you know, you see it game in and game out right from the jump. Like, it's not even taking guys two, three, four weeks to get acclimatized anymore. I mean, guys are just jumping right in. Like, as an example, look at Carter Grace. You know, there's not a whole lot surrounding him to insulate him there uh personnel wise and and he's just been able to and he takes like so much abuse on the floor um for guys like that to just be comfortable and be able to jump in the way they do um is i think is something that deserves some recognition so i wanted uh, to point that out and you know as i as a guy like myself who struggled with a ton of anxiety and the mental side of things as a player during my career um and had that really derail it uh, I just have so much respect and appreciation for how these guys approach the game now and uh, how they play on an uninhibited. Um, and so I just wanted to take some time to to point that out because I think it's something that it sounds simple, but I think a lot of people who've never played sports 
um, especially at a higher level, wouldn't quite understand. Uh, but it like sports truly are 90 percent mental. Um, and, and so when guys can sort of come in and, and, you know, seamlessly make that transition from minor to major lacrosse, I think is great. And I think you're seeing it around the league. So many teams have so many guys that just are, you know, we, we talk about it every week. Like, listen to some of these things, like stat lines, for example, and stats are stats, right? They're numbers. But it's I think it's emblematic of the type of kid that's coming into the league now. They're not, you know, they're not hesitant. They're just jumping right in and playing. And uh, I just wanted to take the time and point that out. All right. So now let's talk trade deadline and the roster freeze that comes Every season on July 1st, anyone I'm familiar with how it works, the trade deadline takes place at 12.01 a.m. on July 1st. 25-man rosters lock. You cannot sign any more players. You cannot make trades. You cannot move guys on and off your roster any longer. So it's a complete freeze. So with that, there's going to be, this year in particular, just with the way the, the playoff format is, there's going to be a lot of buyers or would-be buyers that want to that would want to buy. Um, And I don't think a whole lot of sellers, you know, again, because the way that the playoffs are done, three out of every four teams are getting in. uh, And, you know, in the East, obviously obviously it's two out of three. Uh, So, and then in the case of the central, you've got a team like the chill, who's definitely thinking they can still get in. So I, again, I think that there might be a little bit more demand than supply, uh, but we'll see about that. The first thing I wanted to sort of get into with this is the Warriors and Rebels, I believe, are going to bid for Fodchuk. Um, and Keenan, I've also been told the Silvertips, Blizzard, and Mavericks have all inquired. The problem is, is that those the- those teams don't really have anything to offer the crew. Like, there's no draft capital there. But what I have heard, I mean, I, I and again, I, this is not verified. I've heard this from a couple of people, but it, I'm I'm not. I haven't seen this with my own eyes. I haven't seen obviously emails or anything like that or texts, but um, I was told that the Mavericks kicked tires on buying draft picks from the Rebels, so they would have North draft currency to then trade to the crude for Fodchuk. And I commend them for the creativity. I really do. Like I think if teams that are willing to step out and maybe take um, you know different approaches to try and improve their team, I'll never criticize. But at the same time. That wouldn't make no sense for the Rebels, who I think, along with the Warriors, are obviously in the driver's seat to get Fodchuk. So why would they move picks to let another team get them? Right? It doesn't make. It wouldn't make sense. So um, from that standpoint, again, I would I would anticipate Fodchuk to go to either the Warriors or the Rebels. Um, now, just from a, a team perspective, a, a player personnel perspective, um, and an outlook, I really think that the Warriors need to add um their top guys i just think have too much onus on them and and watching them lately they look tired and worn down um they need they also need more versatility on their offense i I think guys who can feed and are willing to cut off ball if you look at their team the reason they've had so much success is because they've had a great off ball game now the personnel has changed a bit there and i think you know to to refine that success i think they're going to need to return to that uh, having Graydon Cornfield around more on the bench, I think, is going to be paramount. I think he can help with that immensely. Uh, and so, I, but I also think a guy like Fodchuk just makes so so much sense for them. Um, and I think that if I'm putting together, or if I'm trying to get him, I'm putting together whatever package necessary uh, because I think a real rebuild is on the horizon for them, and they might as well go for it while they can. Now, from a Rebels perspective. I think they might be a little bit more balanced right now, roster wise, than the Warriors. Um, they're returning Reed Lowe, uh, who stepped on the floor, I know, for a couple of games this past week. He's recovering from an injury. So um, they're making sure that he's kind of getting back into the fold. Uh, I do think that they could use a passer like Fodchuk, a guy that can feed and distribute the ball. So I think that uh, he also makes sense for them. Now, I, I really do think these those two teams are so close that he could make the difference this year. So watch for that. Um, I think that's a big storyline as we move closer to the deadline. Um, I don't. I will say I don't expect any moves to be made uh, until after the weekend. 
at least in the north, um, as teams see what the miners do with their roster and who they add and and um, what their approach is at the deadline. So I'd wait. Um, I don't think anything is imminent. Uh, they still have ten days. Other other than that, um, just general trade deadline talk. I I think the Shamrocks could could go with adding a another transition type player with offensive upside, um, just to help them a little bit. Add another guy that can move the ball up the floor for them. Um, and I think the Silver Tips could look for a left hander. Um, I, it's unlikely. Uh, but I mean, another thought I had was it's it's probably unlikely, but um. I was wondering to myself the other day if anyone could maybe pry Dame out of the Mountaineers. I mean, they're obviously going to be in a series with the Marauders coming up. It would have to make sense for them and their future. Um, that's another guy I kind of wondered about. That's just me kind of thinking up possible um, moves that could be made. Um, and then the other, you know, the other thought I had was, you know, will Red Deer and the Mavericks be able to add anyone that can improve their depth? So that's sort of where I'm at with the trade deadline and what I sort of expect to happen. Uh, anything to add there? No, I think all of those points are very valid. I I do think that this offseason is going to be the Fodchuck sweepstakes. Um, I don't see the, as much as I want to say, I don't see the crude trading him as a rental again. I don't think teams are going to buy him unless he's a permanent ad rather than a rental. These teams aren't going to look for rentals heading into playoff time. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know about the Shamrocks. I think that they are, they're looking pretty strong. But, hey, I mean, if you can upgrade where you can upgrade, fantastic. And as for Dame out of the Mountaineers, I I don't know. that That's going to be an interesting storyline, too, just based off his recent uh, amazing play that he's had so far for the Mountaineers. So definitely a lot of cool storylines moving into trade deadline this year. Yeah, no, there definitely is. I mean, I would say about the rental piece, uh, as opposed to full, full on, or like a guy that they would get, because Fodchuk does have another year left after this. I just, I think it has to be a rental. Like, I don't see the crew, a wanting to part ways with him for next year, and b being able to get enough back that would make that would make sense for them. Uh, again, like the Warriors are going to be in a big time rebuild going into next year, so I mean. The other thing to remember is the Rebels are also hosting, so a second North team is going to get in. So, I mean, if you're the crew, giving Fodchuk up next year just doesn't make sense. Uh, what I, I mean, I've, I've, I'm have i not going to name names here, but um, I think there's really an easy path here to work out a trade where, you know, the team dealing for Fodchuk gives them a second and then says, look, will send so-and-so and he'll be he'll be yours for next year like you'll have the 2025 rights to so-and-so um i think that's very i think that would work for both teams um especially if it was the warriors not so much the rebels but you know we'll wait and see but i mean i think there's ways that something can be done whether it gets done i would expect it to but we'll we'll, we'll see how that develops now before we kind of go into um power rankings keenan let's talk about player of the week here and uh i wanted to you know there's so many there's so many guys especially this week so you could many. definitely yeah like you could definitely look at you know fletcher and Kleisinger for the shamrocks look great luke royer puts up four including a ridiculous shorthand and goal saturday night um against those shamrocks McDonough, another, another solid pair of games in between the pipes for the silver tips. You know, Dame pops off with nine points Friday night against Saskatoon. Um, Baker and Eastwood do their thing for the Rebels. But, I mean, how how do you ignore Luke Hildebrandt? Like, six goals against the Blizzard Saturday and then eight and one against the Outlaws Sunday. Like, what are we even talking about? Like, forget the RMLL. Find a hotter scorer in the entire country right now and Junior B lacrosse, at least. Like, Luke Hildebrandt has to be the player of the week. Unless you disagree here, Keenan, I that's I think that's the answer. If, if you think I disagree, you are insane. A 14-goal weekend? I mean, come on, man. Some of these teams aren't even scoring 14 in a single game, let alone one player scoring 14 over two. Like, come on. Luke 80%. Hildebrandt, you, you get the flowers for this week, man. 
Yeah, 70 to 75% of the players in the league won't score 14 goals in a season. So it's unbelievable. Um, I, and I hate to sound like a broken record because I know we gave it to him last week with Carter <laughs> Great. But, uh, I mean, just no choice. I know, like, I had seen that he had scored – I'd seen it that he would scored eight goals on Sunday – yeah, it was Sunday against the Outlaws. But I didn't realize that he had scored six against the Blizzard as well until I sort of looked back and I was like, what the – I just – that's just – it's inhumane. It's it's ridiculous. So there's really no other word, way to put it. Um, so he is the player of the week out of the Mountain View Mavericks, Luke Hildebrandt. So power rankings time. And this one, I mean, for this right now, I had to I had to keep the top the way it is. Uh, Shamrock's going to stay at one. Really no explanation needed for that. They get the monkey off their back, beating the Warriors for the first time in five years. Um, you know, since pre COVID, so that was a big thing for them, I think, as they move forward and look to gear up for the playoffs. Number two, still staying with the silver tips inside that number two spot, they get that tight. They're kind of like the opposite of the chill, where they just find ways to win, especially those closer games. So they're going to stay at two. I know they dropped six five to the Rebels, um, on, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, there's not enough. I just the Rebels division, I think pulls them back for me a little bit. Um, so Silver Tips will stay at two. The Kings will stay at three. Not going to pull them back. Their offense still as good as anyone's. Uh, and, uh, you know, their issues are are, are well known, but um, they're going to stay at three. And now I'm going to move in the Mavericks and the Rebels. And really, you could put either one at four or five. Uh, the Rebels uh, have really shown that they can score of late. Um, I think they've picked up that side of things. And they're getting major contributions from the guys they need to get them from. Um, and the Mavericks, I mean, we just talked about Hildebrandt. Um, and they're, they're, I'm just putting them above the Rebels simply because they've played a tougher schedule. Like they're playing um, those teams in the Central. And that division is just, like, again, it's, it's really tough. That's really the only deciding factor between those two. You could put the Rebels at four and the Mavericks at five. Uh, but for now, I'll go Mavericks four, Rebels five, and you're up. Well, my top five, I definitely agree with you, keeping the Shamrocks at number one. I mean, there's no denying that the Shamrocks are <laughs> likely, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but they're likely going to be, uh, barring, again, a major collapse, one of the final two teams left in Larry Bishop. Um, moving down, I actually have moved the Rebels up to second um, simply on this outstanding six game win streak that they're running right now. And that includes this past weekend that went against the uh, central leading silver tips. Um, just looking super strong against the silver tips uh, moving down in third. That's where I put the tips just falling down the rankings a little bit, just based on recent play. Um, I don't, I, I could easily swap around silver tips and rebels as two and three, um, but that's who I have there. Uh, at four, I have the Mavericks. Uh, again, they're just ridiculous, Luke. Absolutely ridiculous from Hildebrand. And like you said, Mavericks pl have played a fairly tough schedule so far. Um, so I have them slotted in at four. And then the Kings I'm keeping in the top five. They just slot down a little bit just based on uh, the Mavericks' kind of recent play. Uh, and then honorable mentions, I have the Warriors and the Blizz. Um, it was hard trying to pick a four-five. Uh, it was honestly between Mavericks, Kings, Warriors, Blizz, but uh, my top five, Shamrocks, Rebels, Silvertips, Mavericks, Kings. And it would, Keenan, that would be the first time that the Warriors are going to sit outside the top five of the power rankings in what would be two calendar years. So it'll be interesting to see where they go from here and still like right in the middle of it all. They're going to have a, you know, a great opportunity and a great chance to what will likely be go, you know, likely go head to head with the rebels for the North title. Yeah, no more. Absolutely. They'll be uh, fighting it out more, more than likely. I mean, I don't really see the outlaws uh, taking the victory again. I mean, the rampage did it to the silver tips last year, but um, this year I don't see the outlaws taken out either the Rebels or the Warriors in round number one. And looking ahead to the Week 9 schedule after a bit of an early start to this week, uh, two games, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, uh, that was the Senior Drillers and the Saints, and then the Senior B Rebels and Outlaws uh, taking on one another. 
Uh, we got six more on the docket for you. A trifecta of games on Friday. The Marauders and the Shamrocks live from Stoop Apart at 8 p.m. Also 8 p.m., Warriors and Rebels. That game, Moya Recreation Center. And the Regina Queen City Kings coming out to face the Silver Tips. 8.30 p.m. start time from Plainsman Arena. Two games on Saturday. The Mounties taking on the Shamrocks. 6 p.m. start time from the Stew. And Saturday, 8 p.m. from Jerome Ginla Arena. The Rebels and the Crude. And the lone game on Sunday, 1 p.m. from Bill Hunter. The Mavericks taking on the Warriors. Thanks for that rundown. Now, as always, you can hit me up on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, MJ underscore nine, and on Instagram, m.joma. You want to talk across, give some feedback, or, you know, give predictions on what you think might happen. I welcome all of it. As we get close to the playoffs, now on a much more serious note, I just wanted to uh, take the time to reach out to the lacrosse community and let them know that former Junior A Edmonton Eclipse goaltender and Edmonton Rush draft pick Mike DiGirolamo was recently admitted to the ICU and is currently fighting for his life. Um, I ask that everybody, whether you know him or not, you probably know somebody that does. Um, and I, I just ask that everybody out there sends their thoughts and prayers to him and his family you got this, Mike. You've always been a battler, and I know you're going to come out of this on the other side. Thanks so much for listening to the Junior Beast Pod. We'll talk to you again next week. So long, everybody.